No disrespect to our other speakers in this series. Um, our star guest, this is Susie Boniface. Susie Boniface used to work for the Sunday Mirror, worked there for 10 years. Um, as you'll hear, she worked on some amazing stories. Uh, she was the, uh, the Fleet Street Fox blogger who uh, took the lead of uh, tabloid reporting uh, and is now going to be a prime player in the newspaper which is launching next week. For no points, what is the name of that publication? The New Day. The New Day, a publication which uh, will neither sensationalise nor terrify you with the news, uh, which I think is an interesting ethical uh, arrangement. Um, even more exciting than that, Susie is the author of The Bluffer's Guide to Social Media. You guys are world experts on the use of social media, but um, in certain aspects of it, you could do with uh, a lot of guidance, um, not least in the legal aspects thereof. You'll find lots of stuff in here. Please buy it. We've got some copies coming to the library, uh, but um, Susie has a career uh, as a freelance journalist uh, and author to maintain, so I want you to buy copies. It's a very reasonable six ninety nine. Okay. And with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to Susie. I look forward to it. Hello everyone, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming along this day. I don't want to walk down doing these things, but I'm going to have to sit down because I need to have my baby breakfast. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm kind of amazed uh, that Alistair and the others ever invite me to be here to talk about media ethics. Because for 20 years I've been told I don't have any. Um, I was a reporter from the age of 18, uh, and I, that entire time I thought well, I had no ethics at all. I had no ethics because I was a journalist, flat. It didn't matter whether I was working on broadsheets or tabloids, on local newspapers, on national, on TV, radio, or anywhere else. There are people in the world who assume that because you're a journalist, <coughs> you're automatically scum. That's that. You are a second class citizen when you're a journalist. You have less legal rights, you have uh, fewer. Um, reasons to call the police, more reasons to call the police, but fewer chances of actually getting the police to do anything on your behalf. Uh, you are something worse than a banker or a pedo or a cockroach or a scrounger. You're kind of a mix of all of those things together, as far as the average human being in the street is concerned. Now, I didn't do what you did. I didn't go to university. I did my NCE on the job, uh, and then started working in the newspapers before going up to Fleet Street. So no one taught me any ethics. No one sat me down and said, today, children, we're going to talk about um, what is right and wrong in journalism. It kind of, it's stuff that I learned on the hoof, it's stuff that happened during the course of my career, which hopefully is still ongoing, uh, and it's uh, things that perhaps get discussed with more senior reporters or your colleagues as you go through the day, and as you develop stories, and as you find things out as you go. Uh, and the main thing I can tell you about ethics from those 20 years is that everything you think you know is completely <coughs> useless. Utterly. With no respect to Alistair or other lecturers here, everything they're going to tell you about what is ethical and what is not ethical is very good and very well done for them. But it's not worth paper written on, frankly, because it's going to change every single time a different story comes along. And that's the point about ethics is that you can't say definitely what's right and what's wrong. You cannot do it, and I'm going to prove it to you. Um, whether ethics something you're taught, or whether it's something an opinion that you have, journalism always throws up something to confound you. In the course of doing a story, uh, whether you are a reporter, a photographer, or a page designer, or a lawyer, or doing sport, or anything else, there will be something that comes along to challenge you and make you think something different. And it will challenge your own ethical preconceptions, if you see what I mean. So if you think a celebrity is stupid, you'll find yourself one day interviewing them and discover they're quite brainy. If you think a particular politician is incredibly moral and principled and you quite admire them, you'll meet them or hear about them or see them in action when the cameras are off and decide they're actually fairly venal and corrupt. Um, what is ethical one day is going to be unethical the next. You will not be able to get your heads around it. It will be very difficult. <coughs> Two particular cases. Uh, this is 
Peterson Stories for May 2011. Now, uh, at this particular time, uh, the whole country was up in arms about the issue of privacy. And everybody wanted to know what football it was who had taken out a super injunction that stopped anyone talking about his private life. It turned out it was Ryan Giggs, who had a lot of um, family-friendly endorsements, made a lot of money out of being a nice family man, who had been shagging his sister-in-law, uh, paid for her to have an abortion, <coughs> pissed off his brother, various things, all very private, all stuff that nobody would have a right to know whatsoever about you or me or Ryan Giggs in normal situations. But he had a super injunction. And there was so much talk about super injunctions that people broke them. And it was the biggest outbreak of civil disobedience in this country since the Peasants' Revolt in the 14th century. People were tweeting Ryan Giggs over and over again. People were posting pictures of Ryan Giggs over and over again. Everybody knew, and eventually the papers were able to say, we're not breaking the super injunctions. Attorney General, you can't stop us. We, we can name him finally. But the only reason the papers got around is because someone mentioned it in the House of Parliament, which had privilege. That was May the 24th, 2011. That's what those front pages are for. This is the News of the World front page of The Guardian about Hackney Willie Dower, which was July the 5th, 2011. Both issues about privacy. Both massively, uh, publicly um, interesting and which showed, really, the public spirit, the public mood, the social mores of time turned on a dime in the space of six weeks. One minute, you've got to know everything about everybody, just about their sex life. Next minute, you can't know anything about uh, a missing schoolgirl. This is outrageous. And that's why ethics are so confusing and so difficult. A journalist's job is partly to keep up with your readers social mores. And you're going to fail at that because it changes so quickly, especially these days you've got social media, you've got the internet, you've got very fast moving news, you're not going to be able to keep up with what people expect you to be at all. So, some quick hands up. Um, put your hand up if you think phone hacking is wrong. <coughs> Anybody? Right, most of us. Keep your hands up, put your hand up again, if you think phone hacking with celebrity is wrong. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, what about phone hacking with criminals? That one. Hands up if you think phone hacking with criminals. Is that the viewer? I think that's wondering what kind of criminal it might be. Uh, if you had the voicemail pin code that Jimmy Savile had, he had a mobile phone, which he didn't, and then I didn't even know why. Um, if you had a mobile pin code for Jimmy Savile and you knew there was evidence on that phone that would expose him as a pedophile while he was alive, would you have hacked his phone? Hands up if you would. How about, would you hack a phone to locate a missing child? Yeah, quite a few people. That's what happened to Lily Dallin. Neville Felbeck was the chief reporter for the News of the World. He was working on the news desk one day. School girl gone missing. No one knew she was dead, just missing. News the world did what they often did with a lot of people's phones. They listened to the voicemails. Uh, and on there they found a voicemail which appeared to be from a, an employment agency offering her a job. Basically, <coughs> that meant that she was alive. Excuse me. Um, contacted the police to say that they were alive a little bit after they'd been working on the job themselves. They did contact the police, so the police said, Thank you very much. Sorry, police were also listening to the voicemail messages. Um, it was sort of six months later that Abel discovered Millie's body, so they realised Millie was dead. Turned out, eventually, in the fullness of time, that voicemail message from the employment agency had been the wrong number. News of World journalists didn't know that at the time. But Neville's defence, his mitigation when he was in court, charged with phone hacking, and later convicted and served jail time, was that he thought he was looking for a missing schoolgirl. And he thought she was alive. And he thought he was doing, uh, using a journalistic tool, which he thought was acceptable, uh, to try to find her. And like about a quarter of people in this room, apparently would have done the same thing. He did three months of it. I also point. Neville Thurlbuck from Sunderland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
gentleman now is his name. Chap with all the leather arm patches on his elbows. Like all some of them. Ethics are in the eye of the beholder. This is the thing. Ethics aren't just what you think or what Alistair or else tells you is right or wrong, what the editor tells you is right or wrong. Ethics is in the eye of people who see it and make a judgment about it. Now, don't take this as an attack on the Guardian, okay? Because it's not. This is just a series of facts you should make your own mind about. Most people, pipe up if you disagree, most people <coughs> assume that The Guardian is the most ethical newspaper in Fleet Street. Most people would say that because of the phone hacking investigation, it's probably very ethical, because not many people would investigate their own industry. I would agree with that as well. Um, most people say that hacking investigation was fairly unimpeachable, that it was a very moral thing to do. Uh, part of that campaign, <coughs> which included calls for a variety of people to press reforms, was that there should be rapid and instant corrections uh, given due prominence in a newspaper, because tabloids quite often weren't doing that sort of thing. So this is their front page from July the 5th, 2011. News the world hackney Dallas phone during police hunt. Fact they did. Exclusive, paper deleted, missing schoolgirls' voicemails, giving family false hope. That's a strap. <coughs> This is the story in the online version, as of yesterday, I did a screen grab, missing million dollars down voicemail on Cat by News of the World. The strap subheads changed slightly, <coughs> deleted voicemails gave family false hope. Uh, family lawyers says the actions are heinous and despicable and interfered with the police hand. Uh, this story was edited on 12th of December 2011, and you'll see right at the bottom here, see footnote. <coughs> That's how it was edited. This is the footnote, and it's right at the bottom. While the news of the world, Hackney and Alice phone, the newspaper is unlikely to have been responsible for the deletion of a set of voicemails from the phone that caused the parents to have full hope she was alive, according to a Metropolitan Police statement made to the local inquiry on the 12th of December. Now, that correction appeared on page 32 six months after the news of the world had shut down. After 200 journalists, who were not employed mostly by the news of the world at the time of the hacking, uh, had lost their jobs. This is a report, also in The Guardian, uh, about Justice Leveson, uh, which was published on November 30th, 2012, on page 15, saying that uh, it, the police accepted and, the, and Lord Leveson accepted that News of the World had intercepted some voicemails, but they are probably deleted by a mobile phone provider. And that her parents would have had that horrific moment of false hope whether or not the News of the World had, delete, had listened to those voicemails. That's uh, something from September 18th, 2015. The Guardian <laughs> called for new press regulators. They'd called for prominent <coughs> corrections, they'd called for instant clarifications, they'd called for being better about the people that we write about, and they're the most complained about newspaper. They're not, also, they're not in any press regulator now. They decide to regulate themselves. I wonder what the Guardian would say if the Sun or the Mirror or the New Day was deciding to regulate themselves. That's not to say... Well, the New Day please sign up to himself. You should think so, it's a um, that's not to say that The Guardian isn't the most ethical newspaper in Fleet Street. It might well be. All the others, you might know, are worse than this. It does mean they're pretty hypocritical, I would argue. So, some of the quick uh, pop quiz. Uh, hands up if you would say that marriages are a private matter. That's not a trick question. That's one no. Marriages are a private matter, roughly. Okay. Marriage breakups, they're private too, right? Even if someone's cheating on somebody else. Not so much. Okay, what about politicians' marriages? Are they private? Hands up if you think they are. Most of them are. A bit small, but that's Chris Hume, my favourite picture of him. Um, his marriage breakup, his marriage, he put in election leaflets, his marriage breakup led to three criminal convictions. One lying election pamphlet, uh, three penalty points, and at least one job so far. 
and he's an ex-Gavin Gilman, uh, and he's a very strange fish. So, right, last one. Um, the contents of people's dustbins, are they private? Hands up if you think they are. Really? You think they're not private? Most people would say the dustbins are private, roughly, especially if they're on your property. Uh, politicians' dustbins, particularly private? Uh, more or less private, anybody else's? What about uh, politicians who are threatening to tax people for not recycling properly and who don't recycle themselves? Would you look at that politician's dustbin to see if he was recycling? Yes or no? Two at the back, definitely. You're brave. Right, well, I did. I went through David Cameron's dustbin. And <coughs> I think that's 2000. I can't, can't remember what day it was. Anyway, 2009 maybe. Um, the context of this was that uh, the week before, the mayor on Sunday had taken all those sort of heat cameras round all the Labour cabinet ministers who were in government at the time, took them out of their houses and uh, managed to get footage of how much heat their houses were losing. Uh, the Labour government at the time were furious, talked about invasion of privacy, talked about how disgusting it was. David Cameron, who was in opposition, went, this is brilliant, why are they moaning about privacy? Yeah, it's quite right, they're saying that if your house loses heat, you should get fined more or taxed, so why can't we see their houses? Uh, next week we went into work, and my boss and I agreed that we should, I was working for Sunday Mirror at the time, you know, the Labour paper, we should do something similar to um, the Tory, just a hell of a bit more than anything else. Uh, and David Cameron had a, a new policy uh, saying that if you didn't recycle properly, you would be penalised financially. So we said, well, why don't we see if he's recycling? It seemed a reasonable enough and a public interest enough thing to do. We discussed it with the lawyer. We looked into it with the local council. We compared it to the Code of Conduct written by the editors, Code of Conduct Practice Committee. Uh, and we found out that Bin Day was on whatever day of the week it was, Wednesday, in Cameron's neck of the woods. Uh, and the lawyer gave us some very strict advice about what it is that you do. And he said, look, if the bin is on David Cameron's property, you can't go on there and look at it, because that's trespass. If the bin, uh, if the dustman comes down the road, goes on the property, gets the bin, and takes it out and puts it in the lorry, you can't intercept it at any point is that rubbish has then been claimed by the council that technically belongs to the council. So even if you had a really good story about, oh, that's my bin, I had to get something out of it, please, you're, you're actually breaking the law to try to do that. And the lawyer said, the only way you can possibly look in David Cameron's dustbin is if he brings his dustbin onto the pavement and dumps it there, and it sits there for a bit before the council comes along and gets it. Because then it's technically littering, and you're allowed to pick it up or do something else with it. But, he said, you can't steal it, you can't take it away, you can't do anything weird with it, and uh, you have to return it, because theft is the permanent misappropriation of another person's property. It is technically someone else's property, even if they've dumped it, so you've got to return it to the place you got it from. Right, so we had all the legal advice, we looked at the code of conduct, we compared public interest offences, we knew roughly what we were doing. I went down to the Cameron Street with a photographer, and we sat and waited. <coughs> and the dustman came along, went on to the property, picked up some black sacks, dumped them on the pavement, did the red house down the road, walked around the corner. Uh, and there was, the dust lorry was miles and miles away. He was well in advance. So with my uh, heart in my mouth, and expecting special secret services to jump out of a tree at any moment and shoot them back at head, I ran down the road, uh, as those chocolate or something, scooped up a, a dust bag, a bin bag, and went around the corner uh, in a bit of a panic, I caught my breath for five minutes, I chucked it in the back of the photographer's car, chucked, kept my breath for five minutes, realised I was still alive, also realised I had six bags back on the pavement, so I did this another six times. Um, the photographer at that point refused to have this stuff in his car any longer, he could stand, so I had to go in my car. Um, we had to go and see what was in the bags, and you can't just open six bin bags in the middle of the street, that would be weird. Um, and also a bit windy. So we had to go and find somewhere that was sheltered, which unfortunately was my garden. So we took David Cameron's dustbin back to my garden, because um, there was fences all around it, so it wasn't too breezy. And we had to 
to look at everything. And I had to write down in my notebook, you know, uh, these are recycling sacks, same bits of plastic, same bits of glass, same bits of whatever. These are the non-recycling sacks, same lift, same lift, blah, blah, blah. Wasn't looking at it, wasn't reading anything, wasn't going through it pruriently, literally counting items of refuse. Phoned the office, gave him a quick brief, he said, he's not recycling. There's loads of stuff in a non-recycling bag that should be released. He would be uh, subject to his own fines. He's an hypocrite. Is this in the story? The photographer had to take photographs of all of this, not because you'd want to put pictures of this stuff in the paper, because it's not very exciting, but because we had to have the legal proof that those things were definitely in those bags. Um, there is an interesting picture somewhere of me actually going through dustbins, but I don't know where it happened. Anyway, at one point, uh, I briefed the desk. The desk brings me back and says, right, the editor wants you to go in on the nappies. And I said, what? Because um, there had been a whole bunch of nappies in some of these recycling sacks, which you just like off in one corner, right? And uh, the editor at the time was a female, and I think she just had a child, so this was something that was of, of issue to her, and of issue to the average Sunday Mirror reader, who is generally a mum as well. And she said, uh, the, editor, the boss says, um, no, nappies are a big thing. Uh, every disposable nappy lasts for 500 years in the landfill, they never rot, they're full of chemicals, they are horrific. Many of the people in this room were raised using disposable chuck away pampers. Every shit you did as a baby is still there. <laughs> it's going to be there long after you're dead, long after your children and your grandchildren are dead. It's, uh, it's a big environmental hazard. Uh, full of chemicals, full of crap. Go to the landfill, there's no oxygen, doesn't rot, everything's just foul. Anyway. Nappies are a big thing, they're a big thing for our readers, and they are a big cock up for David Cameron to have made in this instance. So you have to go in on the nappies. Kind of, right. So he said, but you have to go back over the nappies. What do you mean I've got to go back over the nappies? So you've got to go back because he's got three children at that point. There's Ivan, who is the older disabled child, who's about six, and there's a couple of younger ones, a toddler and a newborn. <coughs> and he said, We just need to know how much of each kind of nappy we've got, because they're different sizes. Because you want to know, if, you know, if they're all Ivans, we might have a different story, or might not do the story. No, right, right, I'm counting the nappies. Right, counted the nappies. There was three lots of nappies, three different sizes, they're all bagged up, you know, this is, and I was in for life. Anyway, three bunches of nappies, all roughly the same kind of number. <coughs> it was still a story. I wrote my copy, which was, he uses a mountain of non-EK nappies, uh, and the first sort of three or four paragraphs were all about David Cameron's nappy hypocrisy. <laughs> anyway, um, he talked green, basically the story was that this was a politician who wanted to be in power, who talked green but was not green. Uh, it was a great story, and it would have been followed up everywhere on the Monday, except for um, a gentleman by the name of Andy Coulson who was David Cameron's spin doctor at the time, and who gave a lobby briefing to the political journalists after our piece published, and accused me, and I love this phrase, of sharp practice. Which, although this was before uh, the phone hack and scandal broke, and Coulson still had quite a reputation in Fleet Street, and I took it rather amiss, and I still take it rather amiss, that he accused me of sharp practice when he was doing what he was up to. Anyway, um, at that time, there was no complaints from David Cameron or his family to the press regulator. There were no legals. Uh, we put in the copy quite clearly what we had done. The reader knew what we had done. There were no complaints from members of the public. Um, there were no <coughs> complaints from the Conservative Party as a whole. There were no ethical worries or considerations. There was no PCC investigation. Uh, he had, at this time, this kind of time he was putting up small wind turbines on his house in North Kensington. The wind turbine came down. He never mentioned green stuff again, ever. And I'd like to think that was just him. Um, he's, he's actually started talking about green crap instead now, which I'm not so proud of. But uh, he's, he fundamentally changed his position on that political thing because he was exposed for the hypocrite that he was. I recycle a lot more now, just in case anybody ever gets to The thing is, what I did then was ethical then. Nobody raised an eyebrow, apart from Mr. Andrew Coulson. Uh, that was about 2009. Phone hacking was 2011. 
Loves New Choir is 2012. I started blogging in 2009-2010, started to become a bit more high profile. When my identity became known, when I outed myself, which was beginning of 2012, I started getting people Googling me and going, oh my god, you stole a disabled kid's nappies. And genuinely, I still get it. It was ethical at the time, it's not ethical now. It is not considered the kind of thing we do now. It doesn't matter how many times I say, I didn't steal anything because I gave her back afterwards. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that I say, we checked with a lawyer, we checked with the PCC, we checked with the code practice, we did everything we possibly could. It's not against the law. Um, and it was in the public interest. It's not considered ethical now. Can I just ask, I, I would consider that to be eminently ethical. You know, for a public interest defence uh, to, to identify hypocrisy of a politician, can I just ask, do you, would you think it is, it's acceptable now to do this? I certainly think so. I think most newspapers wouldn't do that kind of investigation. They wouldn't yeah. start it. They wouldn't try it. Um, when I was tweeting or blogging stuff, which some people found unacceptable, you know, Jemima Khan was saying publicly, you stole a disabled boy's nappies. Um, I didn't steal my nappies. I didn't put them in a fucking recycling, right? <laughs> this twat did. I didn't know they were in recycling. All I was doing was looking at recycling. I happened to come across some shitty nappies. <laughs> um, the week after, uh, Cameron actually went on television saying, oh, it's because I've got a disabled son. Uh, and said, I can't possibly use eco nappies. They don't sell them in my disabled son's size. I went to his local Waitrose where there are disabled nappies and uh, nappies up to adult size in the eco variety, which he could easily afford because he's worth four million pounds, uh, you know, 200 yards from his house. So he was lying. And we did that piece that was perfect. But um, I even got trotted out quite a bit for um, explaining, both by, by Andy Coulson, I would say, rather than by David Cameron. But he got trotted out quite a bit as explanations for things that weren't necessarily very going to be popular with voters. So ethics depend on your point of view, okay? And whether you are Hume or Cameron or Sam, uh, it's all different. All those stories are different as far as the hack is concerned. Um, but the hack's point of view is the least important. Your point of view about whether or not what you've done is ethical won't matter to anybody else whatsoever. Um, but it will be you that decides. It's the hack who makes the choice in the end. So who's to say you're right? How can you say that you're right when you make an ethical decision? Is it in the code of conduct you can say? Well, the code of conduct, for example, has got nothing whatsoever about paying public officials in it. And we've just had a huge national uh, scandal with journalists being accused of paying public officials. And that's apparently very, very unethical. Uh, what about if your editor says that what you're doing is right or wrong? Well, there's plenty of times that they have a different way of looking at things than you do. Trust me. The reader might say what you're doing is right or wrong. Perhaps. When I was at the Sunday Mirror, I used to have a news desk secretary, it was a lovely lady from the pad. And if we weren't sure about something sometimes, and if the lawyer was busy, we would go to Pat and say, Pat, uh, do you think this kind of thing is the right thing to do, whatever you're doing? And she'd go, oh, no, don't like that. <laughs> and sometimes she'd go, yeah, fuck them. At least pull off Pat. And she, she usually had it right, in terms of being you know, a voice off the street, as it were. How about if, you're, if you think what you've done is ethical? <coughs> well, fine. You can tell all of those to the judge. You can say, I thought what I was doing was right. You can say, off Pat said it was okay. You can say, your mum thought it was all right. Or the editor told you it was the right thing to do. The judge won't necessarily believe you or agree with you. Neville thought he was right. He wasn't. Perhaps in 50 years' time, he will be proved to have been right somehow or another. I thought I was right. I still think I was right. But in 50 years' time, I might change my mind. It might be different again. Hume still thinks he's right, despite the fact he's done jail time. You will have your ethics judged by strangers every single day. And they're not going to know uh, all the stuff that you know about it. You know, all that stuff about uh, Millie Dowell and the Guardian, lots of people don't know that the news of the actually never deleted those voice mails. But they have the, the ethical judgment of the news of the world nevertheless. People who do know about the apologies have a different opinion, perhaps, of the news of the world, or a different opinion of the Guardian, or at least slightly 
know, more rounded than the edges. People have a judgment about you. You have written or said anything. You learn on the ground, and it boils down, in the end, to what you personally can bear. Um, as far as editors and telling you what to do are concerned, I was working for Daily Mail at one point, and I was in Shropshire on a story about someone had a love child with somebody they shouldn't have had a love child with. And my instant was really getting to talk to me. And I uh, went up to the door, we'll think about it, go away. Uh, go back again, all right. Knock on the door, we're still thinking about it, we're not sure, we should be able to do this, okay, we'll think about it a bit more, go away. Um, went back several times. Uh, now, under the 1997 Harrison Act, you can't go back more than twice if you've told him yourself. So I was starting to feel a little bit edgy by this point. Uh, I must have been sitting outside their house in a lay by for a week, I think. Uh, the editor was saying, go back, 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 go again, go again, ask more, and need it now. Because the news editor had said something to the editor, they were going to get this, they were very keen on it. And I was the person who had asked, pretty much, to repeatedly break the law, and to go back, and to go back, and to go back, and to go back. And it got to the point where, I was very young at the time, that was my, one of my first jobs in Fleet Street, uh, I was in a bit of a state, and I was worried about it. And I just decided that I couldn't bear it anymore. And I was going to say to the boss, yeah, I've done that. Yeah, they're thinking about it. And I wasn't going to go and knock on the door. And that was an ethical decision that I had to make right then and there. Because if there had been a problem, if they had called the police, there was more than enough evidence to convict me under the Harrison Act. It was me that was going to go to court, not the editor. It was me that was going to pay the price. It was me that was going to get the flag from the media columnist in the dark. It was me that was going to be in trouble. Um, Ethics are as important on everyday stories as they are on the big ones. Journalists worry that it's the big ones, the big exciting things, that that's when you need to worry most about ethics. <coughs> but I remember covering a car crash in Gloucestershire at one point, uh, and it was um, two cars collided head on, one of them was driven by Albert Tow, and was pissed off his face. Uh, everybody involved died, pretty much. And um, I had to go around to all the families and do death knocks on all of them. I hate death knocks never liked them at all um, and every time you have to try and be polite and sensible and sensitive and I'll knock on a bunch of these doors and people would say oh it's terribly upsetting but come in sit down and have a cup of tea here's the family out which actually kind of makes you feel worse in a strange way that you're being that intrusive uh, when I got around to the scumbags house they came out with the lump of wood and set the dogs on me so I felt a bit better about doing it then but that's just a normal everyday story and it's still just as worrying as it is on the big stuff. Um, editors worry most about ethics when it comes to something which is going to get them in trouble. So it's going to get them on the news or they're going to have to explain themselves somewhere. Um, but everyday stories, it's your decision to make that call. Uh, when Mike Tyndall was caught in a New Zealand bar during the Rugby World Cup a couple of years ago, snogging some blonde bit. Uh, half of Fleet Street were sent to New Zealand. I'm going to be able to lie because they were left in the thinking about the expenses. Um, but by that point, the Bribery Act was just about to kick in. The Bribery Act says that you cannot pay people for information they've gained in the course of their job. Does that apply to a barmaid in New Zealand uh, who you're trying to give 50 quid to get the CCTV footage of her? Yes. It's an ethical don't want to be found in a different country having broken the law over there or trying to get back in here or having other problems. Um, you have to decide whether payments really mean that if you're paying someone for their story, whether that means you're paying them to lie. You've got to make that own judgment whether they're lying or whether they're telling you what you want to hear. Um, does it actually just make them more safe in their job? Perhaps slightly more secure if they're at risk of losing their job for doing 500 quid? Uh, can they actually go away on holiday for a week long? <coughs> goes up and they can ignore it and come back and their children are happy. Uh, if you pay someone, it means that you can ID a source. Police can come and find who it is you paid. Do you want to do that? Do you want to expose your source to that kind of... Uh, <coughs> Perhaps ethics comes down to what your motivation is. If my motivation with the dustbins had been, oh, I wonder if I could find some nappies in here, wouldn't that be exciting? It might be a different uh, situation than if my motivation had been, well, let's give the Tories back some of what they're giving to everybody else. Or let's see if he's really recycling. If you phone hack to expose a lie, 
uh, you know, a, a, a light of Parliament, a light of the public, a light of court, perhaps, is there justification for it? You know, if someone is lying to court, uh, the courts take that kind of offence so seriously, it's called perjury, and it's a maximum seven-year sentence. <coughs> now, if I expose perjury by phone hacking, I would probably, considering the crime, I would probably, I think, be prepared to take my chances in front of a jury and explain myself to you, and in front of a judge, because I don't think I'd get an awful lot of big trouble for it, if perjury was that serious. But not everyone agrees. Um, perhaps ethics equals what's in the code of conduct which is open to public consultation that nobody ever knows about it um, but then you've got things like uh, code of conduct says you shouldn't write about the children of celebrities for example yet the Beckhams are forever parading their kids up and down the street in front of photographers talking about them, writing about them farming them out even to the <coughs> uh, ethics says you can't harass someone uh, but a friend of mine uh, went to knock on someone's door to ask if she'd like to talk to her. She said she'd think about it, come back a bit later. She went back a bit later. My friend was about five foot two, blonde, big boobs, quite obviously a girl. Um, the lady's partner, who was not happy with the journalist knocking on the door, was at the top of the flight stairs, <coughs> ran down the flight stairs to the front door, picked her up by the neck, carried her down the front path and pinned her to the bonnet of a car, screaming and ranting and raving. Uh, she was terribly bruised, very shaken up. She called the death. The death said, if you want to go to the police, we will completely support you, but you'll know what they're going to say. She went to the police. The police spoke to the partner and to the woman. The woman claimed that she had told uh, my friend not to come back, which she hadn't. Uh, and the bloke in question, who had pinned this five foot two blonde bombshell to his car bonnet, said he thought she was a bloke. And the police said, no realistic prospects of a conviction. You're a journalist. Get over it. Get used to it. Then you've got something like intrusion into grief, death knocks, which we do a lot of the time. Another friend of mine went to a, an isolated farmhouse to talk to the father of someone who had recently been killed. Uh, he looked a bit dishevelled when he opened the doors in his dressing gown and stuff. But he invited her in into the kitchen. Uh, said, "Excuse me, man, I was going to go and get dressed." Left her in the kitchen. Uh, came back with a shotgun, held her hostage for a while. Um, she started negotiating with him. She started trying to talk him down, calm him down, keep him happy. He was ranting around. He, was, he left the reservation because his son had died, basically. Um, she started threatening him. She had no mobile phone reception. She was out in the middle of nowhere in a farmhouse. In the end, she got away by hitting him over the head with a notebook, which is not necessarily something I recommend you do. But she hadn't done anything wrong. But again, if she reported that to the police, do you think they'd have arrested her or the guy with the gun? Is it ethical to treat MPs and celebrities as though they're second-class citizens? That because the Beckham's son does a lot of things that, that therefore they don't have the same rights as anyone in this room would do to protect their privacy? But by the same is it right to protect, is it right to say that journalists are second-class citizens? They're more likely to be prosecuted for doing something even ever so slightly wrong they can be held on bail for years at a time, that they can be sacked for something they didn't do, etc, etc. Your ethics are yours, right? It doesn't matter what anybody in this university is going to tell you or preach to you, it's what you think is right or wrong that matters at the end of the day. Whether that is phone hacking, or super injunctions, or even what's come as a result of the Levson inquiry, what we're left with is some kind of massive ethical blancmange. Right? You can't do right without somebody telling you you're doing wrong, somewhere. And it doesn't matter what my justification might be for the dustbins or something, uh, someone somewhere will still say it's wrong, because they just hate journalists, or they just hate me, or they're just in that mood to it. Before phone hacking, all we had in our newspapers, we were told, was shagging and tittle-tattle and gossip and prurience. After the phone hacking scandal is over, that's all we're left with. Because now celebrities put your stuff on Instagram, Twitter, that's the stuff you can prove. It's uh, the stuff that's got pictures and stuff with it. If you look at any of our newspapers, now a lot of it is things that people have said on Twitter and Instagram, social media. Because it's the easiest way to get things and to prove it without having a legal um, difficulty over it. Now there is only one rule, really, that works in all of this. Um, <coughs> I'm probably best to tell you about it. When uh, during the Boxing 
Jay Sunam in 2004. I was in Thailand and Burma and Indonesia. And in Thailand, I came across a guy called Patrice, who had lost his wife and his six month old baby on the way he came in, <coughs> they were on a holiday. Now, the only reason that we were uh, came across this guy called Patrice is because my news desk in London had heard that uh, Kate Moss's mate had been killed in a tsunami. And this guy's wife had been a, worked with Kate Moss for something. She's a model for or something. So that's how he hooked up with Patrice. Uh, we went with him and some of his friends that were there around makeshift mortuaries, which were in Buddhist temples around Thailand. Uh, this was about a week after the wave. Things were starting to smell. We bought Wellington boots for everybody to wear because you're walking through bodily fluids. In the courtyards outside these temples, the bodies just can't fight. Um, we bought that special stuff you've got under your nose, whatever it's called, um, to stop the smell getting in. You still smell it, it's still pretty bad. We joined all these sort of queues of people going through bodies looking for their loved ones, uh, which after a week in the tropics and having drowned, we all bloated up and green and swollen. It's not very nice. Patrice, in particular, was looking for his six-month-old daughter called Ruby Rose. And uh, I remember in one particular temple, uh, under a tree, there were a bunch of babies, baby bodies. And the monks had done a decent thing, wrapped it all up in cotton so you couldn't see them. But they'd written on the outside of these bundles any identifying marks about the baby bodies. Birthmarks, um, anything else, whether they're male, female, what kind of age they were, that sort of thing. And Patrice was up in the corner, and he was picking these bundles up one at a time, reading the notes written on the swaddling, uh, to see if that was his daughter. Now, I'd been with him for a couple of days. Uh, he had invited us along. He knew we were there. He wanted us to tell his story back home for people to um, be aware of how little help British citizens were getting from the consulate, and how traumatic it was, and how they needed help from the DEC. And it's totally quiet. And the photographer who was with me was taking pictures of him looking at these dead babies. And each click of the lens was shatteringly loud. It was a lot. And uh, the photographer had to get a shot. We had to tell that story in the most emotive way we could for people back home. And um, I was just stood there watching it. And after a bit, I thought, we've had enough pictures. I can't stand this any longer. And I said to the photographer, that's enough, stop it. Let the guy look. Uh, and photographers do what photographers do, which is the next shot is the one, not the one I've just got. So he wanted to get a few more. I had to nag him, pull him away, leave Patrice to his, have his moment. And that's what it boils down to in the end. You know, a journalist's brain, there's two halves of it. On the one half, you're a normal human being. Standing there in Wellington boots and other people's bodily fluids in a foreign country in a disaster which you don't have any part of, you don't need to be in, thinking in 12 hours I can be back home with my mum and a cup of tea. I do not need to be here, this is shit. And the other half of your brain going, this is fucking great. This is a front page. This is going to help this man and these other people. This is awards. This is something that's going to write like butter. This is something that is going to grip the reader. This is my job. This is why I came into this. And it's the balance between the two bits of your brain. And there's two different conflicts, being a journalist and being a human being. If you go too far one way, you're too soft. You don't have the ruthlessness you need to walk up to someone's front door and knock on it and know you're going to ruin their day. Because you've got a good reason to. And if you go too far the other way, you become too hard, too, too ruthless, and that's when you hack dead girls, boys and girls, fundamentally. There's only one rule that really works, I think. And it's something that Harold Evans, who's a legendary Sunday Times editor, once said, which was, you never do anything to get a story that you would be ashamed to tell the reader about. And I stuck by that in that dustbin story. I told the reader I did. The news of the world did not do it with Lily Dow. Um, and if I had to give you one piece of advice at all, I would say that if Howard Evans didn't do it for you, then try this. Um, watch your back when you're out there. Whatever you're doing as a journalist, worry about your ethics, but be aware that they are not set in stone. Whatever you think is right or wrong will change.
the reader thinks is right or wrong will change. You have to watch your back because nobody else is going to do it. Absolutely great. The only thing I'm slightly concerned about that you as training journalists were not scribbling away frantically using your amazing shorthand. Um, contrary uh, to, to what Susie says, um, actually this conforms massively to what we say all along. What I've said all along is that you have two things. One is that the ethics are a fuzzy concept. They're not set in stone. Uh, it changes all the time, it's not like law, it's something that you have to debate and think about, and it gets down to, ultimately, your own sense of conscience, your own sense of ethics. Um, it's great that Susie talked so much there about privacy, because that's what we're going to look at in the, uh, in the seminars this week. Uh, and on the subject of which, I was staggered to see so few people turn up last week. Last week we went through um, some aspects of, of current aspects of regulation, things which have just changed in the last couple of weeks, hence my questioning there about uh, the New Day and, uh, and Ipsos. Um, you've not heard it from any of the lecturers. This was new breaking news uh, for, for you, and some of you just didn't get it that last week because you weren't there. And the other thing is that we, we looked at some um, fundamental questions of how this works, if ethical thing works, how you can do ostensibly unethical things to get an ethical result. Uh, and I think those those of you who were there last week, I looked at one of them there, a couple over here, I think really fully understood it eventually, what, what this, this strange kind of paradox is. Um, so, with, I hope that makes you, and I want to turn up this week and do the ethical thing and turn up for your uh, ethics seminars. Uh, the other thing, of course, was that several, before you start fiddling, several things um, there that Susie talked about were so bang on for when you do these essays. You know, what is, what is journalistic success? Susie was talk, listing the kind of things that were going through our head there, with the tsunami story. All different kinds of success. So think about that uh, Tomlin question. Um, and also we talked there about death, she talked about death knocks and that kind of intrusion. Um, we're not doing it in depth in the seminars because that will be giving you the answers for that particular question. But you need to look to research that and think what Susie said. Before, we have, a couple of, we have about five minutes left. Um, do you have any questions? Get those pens ready. If you've not done any shorthand so far, do it now. Because Susie is here for only for a few more minutes. Please um, make the best use of it. Can I say on the subject of death notes, I'm sure it's something to bring up anyway. There was a study done a little while ago. Most people would presume that uh, no one likes having their door knocked on when someone's recently breached. And um, it was done in the United Kingdom. And they found that the upper and lower classes really poor are a little bit more reasonable. Um, but there was a study done a few years ago where researchers from the university actually went around and spoke to people who had had their bereavements written about in the press and asked them how they felt about it. And the uh, quite amazing, even though I was surprised, the result was that they appreciated it and they wanted journalists to come <coughs> and knock on their door. Because that way they felt that they were being treated as a human being, they felt being treated with some respect, and that the journalist was able to get the right information. They were, I remember my first chief of board to put me on my first death knock and said, people want to pay tribute. And you don't know who that person was who's died. You don't know their flaws or their failings or how crap they were as a boyfriend or anything. They want to pay tribute and they want to pay them as well as they can. Um, and the, the study found that journalists who don't go and knock on the door, who try to do it from the police press release or who uh, do it online, that kind of stuff, new tributes on Facebook, actually, they fuck up. They're the ones who make mistakes, they're the ones who get things wrong, and they're the ones who cause problems for the bereaved family. Because these are the kind of things they keep forever. If you lose a loved one in that situation, you keep the cutting, you keep the newspaper, and they want it to be right. They want to be more of an obituary than they do anything else. Sorry. The only bit of practical advice I'd add to that, uh, something which I have to follow and follow, is remember to take the photographs back before it was. Uh, occasionally, you know, if you go through drawers of newspapers and like, shit, I should have taken that back ages ago. Anyway, um, questions for Susie? At the back. Yes, um, since you were mentioning about how, kind of, if it's kind of, uh, when getting a story, if it's behaving ethically, is kind of, it's, it's variable and it's seen as, you know, down to each individual journalist. 
Is it is it worth then having like a standard code of conduct, whether it's Ipso or Ofcom or anything like that, if people are going to ignore it to get a story if it's ethical? No, because you don't ignore the code of conduct. It's something you work with rather than around. You should be anyway, um, and you've got to have a framework of something like you should do with any other laws or any other regulations, whether it's uh, the General Medical Council or anything else. You know, doctors have a basic set of rules that they kill people. And there's no reason that journalists should be immune to that. You still have to have a code of conduct. And, um, but we remind people, if they ever discuss it, that it is open to public consultation. It's not a closed shop, unlike the BMC, unlike the politicians, unlike almost every other regulatory body on earth. Uh, the public do get to say what our rules should be. But um, life being what it is, humans being what they are, there are grey areas. And that's where your ethics be. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for It's useful for your practical project. Thanks for outing me. Any anybody else? Come on, we've got time for a couple of questions, quick questions. Yeah. Is there any story that you've done as a journalist that you regret or feel guilty about? Um. I don't think so. Nothing immediately is, is popping into my head. Although the moment I've left, something might suddenly occur to me. Um, the things, no, because when you say guilt or regret, it implies that I would think I've done something wrong. Um, and you wouldn't be able to get through the day or stay in your career if you thought that you were doing stuff wrong on a regular basis. Most people who worry about that kind of thing tend to leave journalism. Um, and I'm not, so I'm obviously ridiculously confident that I'm an amazing human being. But there are times, there are plenty of times when people um, accuse you of doing something wrong, and you, it, it niggles and it sticks to you. And one of the first ones, probably one of the first inquests I ever did at my local newspaper, and it was a guy who um, gassed himself to death in his car at the local reservoir. And he was someone I knew. I went to school with his sons, and uh, went to the inquest and wrote it up perfectly fairly and accurately. <coughs> Uh, and at some point in his inquest, uh, his widow said that she had no idea that he was in such a state, which is a very common thing to say, and it's, it's not the end of the world, it's not traumatic, I wouldn't talk to anybody. Um, she, uh, when, the public, when the story was published, she phoned me up in floods of tears, I was 18 at the time, saying, how could you do that to us, Susan? How could you ruin, how could you upset the boys in this way? How could you say that about me? How could you do this? And she was just devastated. I was devastated because I, I had no idea that I was capable of upsetting somebody that much with what had been said in a public inquest. I put her on to my editor, who came back and told me that really she was just upset at having seen it in um, <coughs> seen it in, in print, as it were, and that was the reason for her reaction, but that it was a perfectly fair and accurate report and hadn't done anything wrong. Um, but there are plenty of times when human error creeps in and you write the wrong thing, you know, and you, you write something that you think sounds one way, and actually it's ambiguous, and the people who read it, or what it's about, think they're saying something different. I've upset entire parish councils that way, and um, government departments, and uh, lots of other people. I think some, yeah, Heather Mills. Um, but if you get things wrong, that's what you regret. You can maybe cock up. Um, either because you've been lazy or slapdash, or because, um, you know, what you thought was right later turns out to not have been right, and there's no reason to object it previously. It caused, caused some upset. But um, I think I've always done my best, and that's just about all you can say, really. You can't ever say you're always 100% accurate, because the person who's told you the stuff you've reported could have been getting it wrong. Um, so, not regret, really. I mean, there are lovely things that I like to have written differently and better and not so quickly sometimes. But nothing... Okay, we've got one more, very quickly. Yeah. What was the point which prompted you to write the blog? Was it a significant point where you thought, like, this needs to be out there, or was it just a culmination of a lot of things? Uh, it's an entirely, entirely different type of thing. Uh, I split, I, well, let me see. I was in a jail cell um, at about 8 o'clock one Thursday night, uh, in wearing flip soles that were about four sizes too big for me, walking up and down Do while I was wearing now? flippers. Sorry? Sorry, I have a session too. Yeah, you are. Sorry, we're just, we're just over. We're finished now. No problem. No problem.
uh, having been arrested for trying to murder my husband and the fat woman I've put up with nothing. And I thought, <laughs> I thought, this is quite funny. This is a story, isn't it? Uh, and then I started writing a blog about that, and it was kind of about how you fix a broken heart, but also what it's like to be a tabloid newspaper reporter, and you actually start reporting on your own life, which is kind of Anyway, thank you for having me. Thank you, Susie.